Okay, hello everyone. I hope you're having a good weekend so far. Today we're going to be discussing a pretty controversial thing, something that causes a significantly wide divide in opinions within the research community, and for newcomers who aren't familiar with these practices, this might be a lot to uh, to take in. But it's important to me because I have experienced it for myself, and so I know that it is real. So today I'm going to do my best, and believe me, I'm perfectly aware of my inability to sufficiently prove or explain this completely. Uh, I'm still trying to find out why this is possible, but it is possible. So these are essentially my best assessments of the situation, and I'm going to try and use language that is more applicable to our scientific world, rather than taking this uh, entirely down the so-called woo-woo spiritual route, even though this is certainly a crucial component of the practice, and we'll get into that as we kind of go on through this. But keep in mind that this is just one person's attempt to provide kind of a blueprint for how this might work. Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain why initiating a form of contact with currently unknown intelligences in our reality, at least unknown to me, some of you may have different experiences, uh, through changing the state of your awareness, the state of your mind, is actually possible. It is achievable. But before we get into this fascinating topic, I'd really appreciate it if you could like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. These things really do help in the battle against the algorithm. Same with the comments. Of course, I want to know what you think, but it also does help this platform rise up the search list. So if you enjoy it, help us grow with a comment. And if you want to assist me in being able to commit as much of my day as possible to securing new interviews and creating content such as this, consider signing up to my Patreon. Not only will you get early access to my content, but you will also get access to our private Discord server, which is full of really wonderful, knowledgeable, passionate, and approachable people who would love to see you join our ranks and help this platform grow. You can also make a one-time donation through PayPal if you would prefer, and links to all of this can be found in the description box below. And now with all of the necessary self-promotional propaganda out of the way, we can actually get into the reason why we're all here. So for those that are unaware of what CE5 means, it stands for Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind, and it describes a method of communication through which a human being can purposefully initiate a contact scenario of some degree, and the nature of this contact can vary greatly with other intelligences in our reality that are currently unknown to us, or at least unknown to me through the utilization of expanded or altered states of consciousness. Now, that does not mean psychedelics. I want to be very clear about the fact that all of my experiences were in a completely sober, fully awake state, most of them occurring in my own back garden during the summer of 2019. But I have recently been doing this type of contact work again, and I'm beginning to see interesting things occur once more. Uh, but my most profound experiences so far we're in the summer of 2019, uh, which I will get into a little bit later. So there are no mind-altering substances involved in this, other than the ones within your own neural chemistry, because you are moving yourself into a more meditative, calm, quiet state of mind, and from here you're moving yourself into a open and receptive state, which can be strengthened through focusing your intentions on the desire for contact to occur, which in of itself could be almost seen as a psychedelic experience because you're altering your own neural chemistry, which is of course responsible for how you perceive reality. So the only real confirmation we have for this not just being an experience projected by a provoked neural network is the fact that we have multiple visual captures recorded by multiple witnesses who've been present for many of these types of contact attempts across the world, who were not themselves engaging in the contact attempts, but were simply there with an open mind and a desire to observe and see what happens. Uh, although I haven't been able to capture anything myself, I have also had people like this with me when doing this type of contact work, and they have also seen things, and it challenged them quite significantly. This actually happened quite recently with a friend who came over for this purpose, but was not himself trying to make contact happen. He just wanted to sit there and see if he saw anything, which he most certainly did. And so my point is that all of this excludes, at least to some degree, the argument that these are simply subjective hallucinations brought upon by a provocation of your neural chemistry. I would also like to preface this talk by saying 
If you take issue with the guy who coined the term CE5, Dr. Stephen Greer, because I do realize he can be a bit of a polarizing figure in this community, I just want you to understand that this, uh, this methodology that is referred to as CE5, it's not restricted to the methods of one man. Uh, it's not restricted to any one method. There is a spectrum of ways through which this type of communication can be successful. And my successes have come from me following my own a uh, more basic method of attempting to do this type of contact work. I wouldn't even really call it a method, but we'll get into my perception on this as we go through. So I would just ask you not to have a like a knee-jerk reaction to the term CE5. It's just the commonly used terminology, so I'm using it for that purpose. Now, I understand completely that this whole concept is absurd and should be considered by any level-headed, grounded rationalist as a pseudo-scientific, woo-woo, Jedi Knight, sci-fi fantasy. Um, you would be the uh, sensible one to feel this way at this point in the discussion. So for those who haven't stopped listening already, who are skeptical, but still curious to see where I take this, work with me here and just keep that mind open enough to think about what I'm saying and really consider and chew over the possibility of this being real. And if you place any faith in me, and why should you, because I'm just a guy on the internet, but if you do feel like there's a level of sincerity, honesty, and passion coming from me when it comes to discussing these kind of ideas, then you have to understand that this happened to me, alright? Contact did happen to me, and it happened in ways that were undeniable, unknowable to a certain degree. I've not been told anything by them, I haven't met the intergalactic ambassadors or anything like this. The only information I have is from what comes to me intuitively because I've given a lot of thought to this entire concept after I was successful with my own experiences. Experiences that occurred when I was attempting uh, the methods that I'm going to do my best to describe for you, whilst also being painfully aware of the fact that I am unable to fully articulate these things myself. So this is just a humble attempt to get you to see this the way that I see it, and perhaps that might help you if you decide to engage in this yourself. But I also have to say that from experience, these types of contact modalities that seem to rely on subtle frequency shifts in human consciousness have a tendency to vary greatly from person to person. And so my method might not be your method, your method might not be the method of another, but there is a way for you to do this, a way for you to tailor it towards your particular uh, perception of reality. Uh, so I'm not going to be teaching you literal methods, so to speak. Look at this as more of a general blueprint, some sort of explanatory framework that outlines the basic principles involved, at least in my mind. But how you then decide to tailor and engage with the utilization of these principles, that's entirely your own prerogative, and it should be like that. It should be your own subjective method that makes sense to you. The only thing that you maybe need to take on board, and I could be wrong here, but this is certainly what I feel is important, and that is that you remain open-minded enough to consider two things. Firstly, that consciousness itself is profoundly mysterious and produces too many anomalies for us to be secure in our understanding that it's just a generated effect of a complex brain, that it's entirely a localized phenomena produced through sufficiently complex networks and sensory interfaces. It's my belief that the brain plays the vital role of expressing consciousness, but not creating consciousness. Your brain is not the generator of awareness. It is the receiver and renderer of awareness. So you will need to move beyond that restrictive lens that does run contradictory to historical and modern accounts and examples of non-local awareness being achievable within human beings. And I'll explain what I mean uh, by non-local awareness in more detail as we, as we go through this. But in essence, you need to move beyond the idea that human consciousness only exists within the brain and is restricted to it entirely because this is not what I see as the case, based on the background evidence that would argue otherwise, including, of course, my own personal experiences that I feel very secure in saying would not have been possible if data, information, or energy cannot be produced by and subsequently emanated from the brain and out into wider reality. So that's the first ideological barrier that you might need to traverse before you can grapple this type of idea be comfortable with it, and begin to have success with these contact methods. The second thing that you need to try and incorporate into your frame of reference is the understanding that life on planet Earth 
is extremely provocative evidence for there being life across reality. The fact that we exist throws all ideas of a, a, a void, dead universe out of the window, especially as we have now so many, not only habitable, but super habitable planets tracked and categorized. We can now estimate that there are six billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. And in the year 2020, 24 planets were identified to be more habitable than Earth, which is 0.6% of all the planets currently known. So applied to the whole galaxy, this leads us to expect that there could be upwards of a billion super habitable planets, more habitable than our own, which has produced complex sentient life. Planet Earth has already done this, and there are planets that are more habitable than this one. And this is just within our own cosmic backyard, to say nothing of the countless other galaxies, too numerous in number for us to even comprehend. Not only this, but the historical and modern examples of intelligent anomalies occurring in the form of what people describe as either UFOs and, and their occupants, or divine messengers, spirit guides, angels, psychedelic astral entities. I'm not making the claim that these things are what we've categorized them as, but what I am saying is that my second request to you is to understand and appreciate that life exists not just across this linear universe that we perceive, but across the potentially infinite dimensional folds of reality. The whole point of reality, in my opinion, is life. So don't imagine that we're alone in this place. We are most certainly not. So to recap, human consciousness has non-local capabilities, and I will explain what I mean by that in more detail. And secondly, that life is everywhere everywhere, even in places that we don't expect, even in places we didn't imagine were objectively real. If you can accept these as, at the very least, highly likely probabilities, and you have a genuine desire to initiate a form of contact, then you will have contact. This I feel quite confident in almost certainly guaranteeing you. You will have contact in some shape or form, but there are methods that can assist you in getting into the right state of mind to become a more refined signal and receiver. And we'll talk about that today as well. But for now, let's start with a bit of background, a little bit of science. This is all leading towards the idea of making contact. Uh, these are the bits that uh, make sense to me, but also keep in mind I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to understand the complex mechanics of physics, but this is what makes sense to me. So let's start with this whole idea of non-locality. Non-locality within physics was one of those quirky aspects of reality that Einstein actually dismissed and kind of set aside as something that he called spooky action at a distance. And in quasi-physics talk, it's the observation that two or more spatially separated systems can exert influence upon each other regardless of the distance between them, suggesting that there is a subtle yet all-pervasive energetic medium that exists within the building blocks of space-time that strings all things together and connects all points and can exert influence upon each respective point regardless of its position within the universe. Basically, things can move and interact with other things across time and space. They don't have to be near each other to do this. So something must be connecting them together. Some sort of energy must be reaching across the universe to allow this interaction to occur. This is also known as quantum non-locality, and it was this realization that the energetic substrates that comprise reality interact with each other in ways that completely contradict the observed state of play within the physical landscape that we operate on. The stuff that makes the stuff you see, including yourself, behaves entirely differently to the way you actually perceive the stuff to be behaving. And so the discovery of quantum entanglement, non-locality, superposition within modern physics, these were spanners into the mechanics of the Newtonian world we've all become so comfortable with relying upon as the explanation for how things work. And we are still, in many ways, stuck in a Newtonian worldview within Western scientific culture. Non-locality, spooky action at a distance, these discoveries continue to challenge the standard reductionist models and barriers within physics, putting strain upon the consensus understanding of linear space-time, uh, because what's normal on the surface world, what we see, is not normal on the quantum level. And the quantum level is responsible for everything that we see, which means that our material world is determined by 
a bustling matrix of quantum energies that behave completely differently to how our world appears to work, and yet these things make the world work. It's a bit of a mind f to be honest. But this opened the door to the development of models that incorporate a non-local aspect to consciousness itself, that perhaps human consciousness is a non-local field that is simply being coordinated into a specific expression, a focalized individuation of senses and circuitry that we call a human being, but that perhaps this human biocomputational system can expand its reach, expand its signal across the energetic networks of information that physicists say reality is comprised of. All of this is leading towards me discussing contact. Remember, these are the mechanics of my own personal perception of why this type of contact is real. Now, a photon is a particle of light that can be defined as a, a bundle or a quantum of electromagnetic or light energy, and an electron can be defined as a stable subatomic particle with a charge of negative electricity. It's found in all atoms, and it acts as the primary carrier of electricity in solids. Now, scientists discovered originally in 1801 by British polymath Thomas Young, but it was further developed upon and understood within the 60s and 70s, and continues to be developed upon today, that both a photon and an electron exhibit what we call a dual functionality. There is a famous and somewhat controversial experiment called the double slit experiment, which demonstrated that photons and electrons exist both as a coordinated particle and a wave of potential energy, and that the collapse of its wave state into particle form is dictated by the presence of an observer. So to briefly describe the experiment, they had a lab set up with a photon generating cannon that would fire a photon at the screen, and it would do this several times. But the screen had a wall in front of it with two vertical slits cut through it. Now I want you to imagine that you are standing in a room that is designed like this test. There is a wall in front of you with two large vertical slits down it, revealing another wall on the other side. And you have a basket full of tennis balls and they're wet with paint. And you proceed to throw these tennis balls at the wall. Now some of those tennis balls are going to go through those two slits. Some of them are going to splatter on the first wall, missing the slits. And so what will happen on the back wall after you've thrown a bunch of these tennis balls? Well, there should be two roughly vertical paint marks that outline the two slits that the balls have passed through. And so taking this back to the photon, shrinking the tennis ball down to quantum levels, we fire these photons at the wall. And just as predicted, we end up with two roughly defined slits on the back wall, where some of these photons have passed through, and we have a peppering of marks on the first screen, where the photons miss the target. But what's happened next is where things get a little weird. They run the experiment without any observational tools. No recording devices, no measuring devices, and no human observers whilst the experiment was running. Once it had finished its sequence, they observed the wall. And they're surprised to see that two roughly vertical lines on the back wall have now turned into a series of horizontal lines leading upwards. And they thought to themselves, well, how could this possibly be? So they ran the experiment again. And they observe that two roughly vertical lines appear on the back wall. So now they run it again, but without observational equipment. And again, this includes themselves. They go back into the lab. And once again, the vertical lines have changed to horizontal ones. And once they had scratched their heads enough, they realized what had happened without anything present to observe the photon. It had changed from a particle of bundled together condensed energy into a wave of potential energy. It had literally changed its entire state from a focalized particle bouncing off the walls to a wave of energy that was lapping up against the walls and producing horizontal lines on the back. And this just blew the minds of those involved, and it has since become a real problem for the reductionists in modern physics, because what this experiment seems to suggest is that a photon or an electron acts as a wave of potential energy, uncoordinated, unspecified, non-local in nature, 
but once a conscious observer enters the room to watch the experiment take place, this wave of potential energy would collapse its state into a particle. And since photons are the force carrier for the electromagnetic force which allows us to see and experience reality in the first place, this discovery could almost suggest that reality itself is nothing more than a consensus projection of what we expect it to be, and that all of this wave energy that comprises matter has simply collapsed into a dense state that allows us to experience it. Without the observer's requirements being present, this dense, bundled energy that is forming everything around you, including yourself, expands out into a non-local wave, before subsequently realigning itself into this collapsed particle state once an observer is present. This is really the stuff of science fiction, and yet it was observed through our modern scientific methodologies. And so this dual state and observer effect has long since baffled physicists, and various models have been drawn up in an attempt to explain it. Some say it's just the presence of a reflecting lens, like the human eye or a camera, that the photon is so sensitive to its surroundings that the mere presence of a lens of some form that refracts light energy towards it will provoke it to collapse its wave function. But I find this to be a very dry, uh, dull explanation. It feels uninspired and lazy. Uh, I think there's something far stranger going on here, and I think this type of experiment has tapped into an underlying mechanic of reality that, in my opinion, is integral to our understanding of human consciousness. And so let's say for now that this uh, dual functionality that we see in a photon could potentially be applied to our state of awareness as a human being. Right now, you could almost see yourself as a collapsed photon, you're in this individuated human form, a coordinated expression within space-time, and your current state of default awareness is informing you that you exist within an immediate environment that's being picked up on and articulated to you through your highly complex sensory system. But what if, through certain practices, such as meditation, or the use of psychedelic compounds, but not necessarily for this particular discussion if you want to remain objective. I mean, you will no doubt meet the galactic overlords on a sufficient dose of dimethyltryptamine, but good luck convincing the skeptics that these beings actually exist. So for the purpose of this specific talk, I think basic meditative practices are better for objective data collection. So using methods like meditation, what if you are able to expand your state of awareness like the photon, from a collapsed, localized, condensed expression into more of a wave state, an expanded state. And through this expanded state, what if you're able to send and receive information across the universe? Like spooky action at a distance, non-locality, quantum entanglement. Perhaps you can even exert physical influence upon matter itself at high enough levels of development through these non-local means. And so I think it's precisely due to our complex quantum biochemical system that is in many ways a computational system. The human being can be seen as a kind of organic computer. I think that due to this, we truly do have settings and modalities available to us through our own mind-body interface that permit for the expanding of our states of awareness to levels that would allow you to traverse the cosmos, not necessarily in a physical sense, but through the mind, through quite literally moving your perception, moving your sense of what is around you into a state that allows you to, in some way, follow the networks that comprise this universe, moving on the quantum level, traveling the way particles do, but doing so as a conscious observer, and I believe that it is through this network of energy that comprises the universe that you can send, receive, and extract sensory and linguistic information via a kind of non-local quantum bridging between your mind and the point or person in space-time that you're desiring to connect with. And when it comes to this idea of making contact, you don't need to know where they are or who they are, you just need to know that they can hear you and you need to ground your communication in a peaceful and loving way. Don't roll your eyes at that. It's important, but we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. So it's probably worth mentioning for those that aren't aware that as wild of a concept this might seem, I can assure you that our Western intelligence communities within the clandestine research labs and think tanks 
that comprise our defense and intelligence architecture are extremely interested in the non-local capabilities of human consciousness. They have been both interested and financially invested in these endeavors for decades, primarily for the purposes of intelligence gathering without the need to send a physical operator into the field. I mean, if you can extract sensitive intelligence from the top left drawer of an office in Moscow without leaving your office in Langley, your strategic advantage against your adversaries is insurmountable, and, and so much effort was put towards the research and development of intelligence gathering methods using expanded states of awareness. This became known as remote viewing, and uh, a rainy afternoon spent trawling through the CIA's Digital Freedom of Information Act library can yield some pretty interesting results when it comes to the subject of remote viewing, so uh, by all means, do that if you feel inclined to fall down a rabbit hole. Now I can already sense that some of you will be saying that this all sounds very dangerous. You're basically casting your conscious line out into the void and hoping what swims up to you is friendly, and I do not think this is the case. However, the aspect of this that I believe is the prerequisite for positive, benevolent, or benign contact is a difficult prerequisite for grounded rationalists and, and scientific minds to digest. So I'm going to get into that in a moment because it's absolutely key to positive contact, in my opinion, but it's also something that many will dismiss and take far too lightly. But if you're serious about doing this kind of thing, then you should take what I'm saying seriously. And I only say that because I've had success in this endeavor enough times to be satisfied with its repeatability so long as certain requirements are met. Because I think that whatever you interact with, it's already on that level. Its level of awareness, its level of conscious development, it is far, far beyond our own. So I think it's just simply waiting for us to make the first move. And when we do, and it's working, and you're on the right mode of consciousness, then these things turn up. And whatever these things are, like for example, the orange orbs that hovered above my house one night in 2019, which I'll talk about in more detail later on, well, it's almost like they show up to let you know you're doing it right. That's really what I think is going on. It's like a lesson in conscious development where the reward for participation is a profound visual exhibition of some sort that provides you with a genuine slice of evidence, even if it's only for yourself, that something is actually going on here. And that perhaps the endeavor of developing your mind like you would develop a muscle is a worthwhile endeavor after all. The only problem is it's such a mind-blowing thing when it happens that the last thing you think about is trying to record it. Although there have been successes and there will be videos shown during this talk of what I truly believe are successful instances of contact being captured on film, uh, but this phenomenon can be very subtle and it seems to exist on the fringes of reality itself. It's very strange. It's hard to capture good evidence of it on film. Uh, we don't know enough about it to fully understand what it's up to, but I truly, deep down in my intuition, do not feel it is malicious or manipulative, and, uh, and I, I do not think this is the same phenomenon that is at play when people claim to have been abducted or traumatized I think we're dealing with a different order of intelligence when you reach out through these methods. So my best guess right now is that I think it's a baby steps learning program of some form. And I think these methods of contact and communication are for the most part within modern human civilization, especially within the materialist uh, doctrine of Western science, a long lost modality of the human being. I think we once had a much more sophisticated understanding and appreciation for the mechanics of consciousness and its ability to interface with reality non-locally, allowing us to explore different aspects of the space-time dimensional landscape, draw information from it to benefit us on the ground level of what we call our consensus reality, and even initiate contact, communication, perhaps even relations of certain degrees with higher expressions of sentient intelligence within reality that have already mastered, or at the very least have a much higher degree of development within the realms of consciousness, non-physical travel, instant quantum communication across the universe via the power of the sentient mind. Now, if this is possible, if human beings are capable of this type of non-local cosmic travel, or 
at the very least have the ability to send signals across this universal network through entering into certain states of mind that expand their awareness, utilizing their intentions, their thought patterns, their ability to visualize and imagine, to produce a signal of some sort, a ripple in dimensional space-time. Whatever it is that actually occurs, let's say this is something we're capable of as sentient quantum bioelectrochemical systems that are strung together on a cosmic network, connected to each other like the internet, all points converging within an energetic substrate that exists at the baseline, at the zero point of our universe. Let's say all of that is possible. And now, for argument's sake, let's say that other civilizations, other sentient beings in this universe and beyond it, into the realms of dimensional reality that incorporate what we see as the astral planes or the imaginary realms or the psychedelic realms, what if there are beings within these spaces? Intelligences that are capable of realizing what we are currently realizing, beings that are capable of doing the same things that we can do within the mind. Not only this, but perhaps some of them have had far more sufficient expanses of evolutionary time to bring this ability to levels of sophistication that would just dwarf even our most capable genius intuitives and shamanistic explorers. Perhaps some of them have achieved this solely through monk-like dedication, and perhaps others have achieved this through an amalgamation of mind and machine, of science and spirit. And this is where we bring this idea of being able to initiate a form of communication, a form of contact, a type of cosmic handshake across vast distances, an invitation to say hello via non-local information transference between two coherent and spatially separated systems, whatever language makes you feel more comfortable with the concept. This is where we bring in the idea that through the use of our minds, we can initiate a form of contact with another intelligent species within reality. I want you to keep in mind that you are an energetic being. And I don't mean this in the spiritual sense, although that certainly tracks alongside this. No, I mean you are literally a system of complex mechanics that utilizes electronic pulses and electromagnetic energy. Your thoughts, your senses, they create fast pulses of electric charge that light up your nervous system and your neural circuitry. And your heart produces an incredibly strong electromagnetic pulse which actually produces an electromagnetic field around your body. So it's no secret that human beings uh, produce an incredibly strong electromagnetic field. In fact, this field typically extends outwards in all directions to roughly three feet from your actual body. Now take into account the fact that your thoughts are literally energetic and your emotional resonance is also energetic. For example, the rush of love and happiness you might feel when seeing a loved one after being separated for a long time. That strong feeling you have is quite literally on a physiological and bioelectric chemical level producing massive amounts of electromagnetic energy which is going to be resonating within your magnetic field. It's going to have a signature attached to it. The same can be said for fear and anger. Strong emotional responses are going to cause stronger energetic resonance, which means the stronger the emotion, the more profound a signature it's going to be producing as a type of discharge within your electromagnetic field. Think about the people who say they can see an aura around a person. The aura is usually represented in different colors depending on that person's character or current emotional state. Is it really so far-fetched to suggest that these people are representative of a small percentage of the population who have a sufficient level of sensitivity to aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum that most people do not? And this allows them to see the coronal electromagnetic discharge of your current emotional state of resonance that's being projected from your energetic state and subsequently being resonated as a specific signature within your electromagnetic field. Is that really an outlandish idea? Because to me it feels quite logical that this is what they're seeing. The electromagnetic field that's produced by your heart is more than a hundred times greater in strength than the field generated by the brain. The heart also contains enough neurological components to be considered a little brain within the body. It's called the intracardiac nervous system, and it's composed of approximately 40,000 neurons. Now, I believe that understanding the power of the heart in both a scientific and even a more spiritual sense is crucial to successful contact because you don't just have to be 
thinking about these things, you have to be feeling them. You have to be truly feeling them on an emotional level. And what I'm suggesting is that this electromagnetic field that's produced by your heart, which is in of itself interlaced with all the electromagnetic fields and networks that surround us, remember that we are immersed in an ocean of electromagnetic energy and other energies, hard radiation, soft radiation. It's all around us. And we produce a localized field of it around our bodies that resonates our emotional state within it, producing signatures that perhaps by a more sophisticated intelligence could be understood, recognized, categorized. My suggestion is that you can expand the area of effect of your own electromagnetic field. You can expand it from three feet in all directions to all places in all directions at once. Like the photon we mentioned earlier, you can take your own electromagnetic field from its collapsed particle state of three feet and turn it into a wave of energy that resonates across reality. And again, if this electromagnetic field around you is resonating your state of mind around your body, what you're doing in order to have successful contact is you are resonating your state of mind across the universe and you are tuning your state of mind towards the intentions of contact and you are charging this state of mind and in doing so charging your field of electromagnetism with the emotional resonance of love, of unity, of peace, of curiosity, you are in the simplest way sending out waves of love into the universe. The hippies were right the whole time. But seriously, this is something that I feel can be explained by physics, uh, but it also incorporates that fundamental and vital aspect that science has ignored for far too long. The spirit of love, the nature of emotion. These two things, intellect, emotion, science, spirit, married together, create the understanding that I'm trying my best to outline here. You can send waves of electromagnetic energy out from your body and into the universe, perhaps even through dimensions, and you can literally imbue these waves, you can charge them with the emotional resonance of your choosing. So why would you choose fear or any other negative emotion? No, you're gonna send uh, love. You're gonna say, hey, I'm here and I feel love, I feel connection. Do you feel it? Can you hear me? You're not trying to summon demons. This is where people in the UFO community get confused. You're not going out there with the intention of having anything other than a peaceful contact. And if you don't believe that your uh, setting of your intentions is enough, if you think I'm naive and I'm opening myself up to manipulation, then that's okay. Don't do this type of thing. But I don't think you're right. I really don't. This to me feels like a process of getting a sentient species to expand and learn and develop in sentience. Whatever responds to you in these states, it's my belief that they are trying to show you that it's working and that you should keep doing it. So now you have a rough idea for my own personal model for the mechanics of this. The information is flowing across the cosmic network of energies that lie at the foundation level of reality. And you, being the complex electromagnetically resonant system that you are, can literally send and receive packets of information across time and space, utilizing these cosmic networks of electromagnetism and perhaps other energetic mediums, just like a computer receives and sends messages across the energetic network that comprises the internet. This is not a, a wild concept. We are literally doing this already. I'm just asking you to look at it in grander terms, in cosmic terms, to see the universe as the internet and to see yourself as the computer that's seeking to connect with another. But we have to sometimes set aside the cold, analytical science side of this and open ourselves up to that part of the human experience that is for all of us on a daily basis far more important. And that's how you feel your emotional state, your sense of importance. Because if you want to have contact with the kind of intelligences that I believe we're reaching out to through these methods, and I believe these intelligences are benevolent, if you want to tune into the peaceful frequency then you're going to need to ground your awareness in that emotional state. Believe it or not, but peace and love are like really important. These are profound energetically emotional states that often can define the grandest moments of human experience. And it is through these states of emotional resonance that you want to be operating on when you're attempting to make contact. 
You want to be broadcasting the emotional state of love, of peace, of curiosity, to know if others are out there that understand these concepts and would like to respond in kind with their own loving response. Like I said before, the whole photon analogy, you want to take your state of mind from the collapsed state where your electromagnetic field is operating at around three feet in all directions. You want to calm your mind. You want to calm your body. And from this place, you want to start to visualize or imagine your thoughts to be echoing out from you. And you want your thoughts to be orientated towards your intention to have peaceful contact. And on top of this, you want to be drawing up your emotional strength by focusing on love, on gratitude, on peace, whatever gives you the best feeling. You want to charge your thoughts with those feelings. And this isn't woo-woo stuff. This is science. This is you charging your electromagnetic system and firing off a message. You want to push waves of love and appreciation and curiosity out into reality. This is how I feel safe doing these practices because this is a very intense concept for people and many are afraid of attracting unwanted and negative attention from engaging in this, which I completely understand. But all of my experiences have felt like little flashlights of confirmation little nods in the form of a visual exhibition, a confirmatory reward of some form that tells me, yes, keep doing this, keep using your mind like this. See, we are, we are here, we can hear you, we can hear you. Let me show you that we can hear you. And bam, you have a sighting of something anomalous. That's how it works. And as I said before, would you not want to be reaching out to the highest order of emotional sophistication that's out there? Would you not want to extend your invitation for contact towards a benevolent intelligence. And so without putting the literal words in your mouth, because I think you need to have your own way of articulating these things, you need to come from a place of love, of peacefulness, of genuine curiosity. This is what yields results for me. When I'm in a very calm state and I'm staring at the stars and I begin to model my thoughts towards usually my ideas about the universe and my hopes for seeing something that believes in what I believe in. And when I truly feel myself move into that more expanded state and it almost feels like my thoughts are echoing out into reality, at the same time my emotional resonance is surging, this is when things happen. And, uh, and it can sometimes be a very subtle state and it may take practice, which is why meditation can be useful as a tool for strengthening the reliability or the repeatability of this contact method. And there have been plenty of nights where I've wanted to have contact, uh, but was not emotionally in the right state. Perhaps my mind was too distracted or I began getting too impatient and it doesn't work. Nothing happens. These are very subtle, very discreet states that you slip into. You don't have to be firing rainbows out of your eyeballs. It's not that intense of a state that you need to get into. But when you get into that state, you will know you're in it. But it really does work, people. It really does. I would not invest this much time and brain power in attempting to explain it to you the way it makes sense to me if this didn't happen to me. For me, these experiences began lightly and elevated in intensity as I continued to actively engage in contact attempts. Uh, flashes of light in the night sky, white orbs that look like satellites coming over but in far higher volumes than I was accustomed to. As a sky watcher who is used to seeing satellites, I mean I've looked at the stars in the sky all my life and uh, I know that we have more satellites up there now, um, but even so it was more than just satellites because some of the satellites would glow and then flash not once but over and over in what felt like responses to my thoughts or greetings in real time and this was the kind of thing I started seeing very often and in greater volumes and I looked into all of the debunking materials the traversal of iridium satellites that can cause flashes from light refraction etc and no doubt I saw something like this once or twice and misconstrued what I had seen. But there were other times where it was simply not rational to categorize that behavior as prosaic and explainable. Too many of them, too many occurrences, too much of a synchronicity between my thoughts and what appeared to be direct responses to them in the form of these visual flashes. Um, but it was in the summer of 2019, in August, that I had my most profound experiences. 
I've spoken about these experiences quite a few times publicly, but for those that have never heard about them, I'll briefly explain what happened to me, because uh, I went from seeing uh, things like uh, these satellite-looking objects that weren't really behaving like satellites, to seeing a triangle formation of orange orbs make itself visible to me by revealing itself out of a cloud. Um, yeah, so a cloud that was drifting past my house and did a complete right angle turn until eventually it was above my head. I'd been, I'd been looking out into a crystal clear sky. I had seen some other strange behavior prior to this, but then noticed that a moderately sized, dark looking cloud was moving across the sky. When I looked closer, um, this cloud was producing an effect that I have never seen before. It's hard to describe, but it looked like the entire cloud had this light overlay of static around it. I could see this kind of shimmer. And the best way to describe it is literally imagine a cloud and then place a light amount of TV static over it. It looked like this, right? And this cloud was drifting in what appeared to be a natural motion. It was coming from the left-hand side of my sky uh, and it was moving across to the right. And I was at the back of my garden looking towards my house. So basically this cloud was going to eventually be above my house and then would keep moving off to the left and continue its trajectory. But this didn't happen. When the cloud drifted across the sky until it was in alignment with my house and myself, it suddenly did a very jarring right angle turn. It completely changed its natural drifting trajectory and was now moving in the sky towards my house and towards me at the back of the garden looking up. So it was eventually going to be above my head, literally did this kind of movement, complete directional change. Um, bear in mind, it had this strange static like effect coming from it and it had done a completely abrupt, unnatural directional change. So already I was a bit freaked out by this and uh, all I could do was stare as it got closer and closer until eventually it was above my head. and. As it got above my head, I, I swear on all that I love in this world, this cloud dissipated in a matter of seconds. It just kind of collapsed in on itself and revealed that within it was a triangular formation of roughly 25, maybe 30 orange orbs of light. Um, they were in a complete formation, triangle formation. The formation kept moving in the direction that the cloud was moving, so I had to turn myself around and watch as it went off into the distance. I could see that some of these orbs were actually weaving in between each other, kind of like swapping places in this formation. And the whole experience lasted, I would say, maybe about three minutes, but it could have been more. It's very hard to know in all honesty. I was in a total state of shock. No intelligent thoughts no peaceful greeting and no desire to even consider trying to film it because I was simply in a state of complete awe and could not tear my eyes away from what I was seeing. I saw these orbs again on another evening, but this time, and this was all within the space of about a month, maybe just under a month, um, they flew across the sky, three of them, and they stopped on a dime directly above me in the sky, or at least above my property in the sky. And then they began to descend down towards my property and they were weaving in between each other in this kind of strange dance-like motion, a little similar to the formation swapping behaviors that I saw with the triangles. They were drifting down very, I mean, I hate to say it, but almost angelically, very magic and strange and quite calming as well, quite, quite a calming, uh, non-threatening behavior in their motion, just kind of flitting down and, and, and weaving around each other. And then they just stopped very abruptly, almost as if they were frozen in place, like someone just pressed pause. And this was roughly three feet above the roof of my house where they stopped. Three of these orbs, roughly basketball sized, um, a light kind of pastel orange color, slightly transparent. And one of the things that I didn't really think about at the time, but upon reflection, I've realized that this was the case, and I've heard other people explain this as well. Um, they weren't giving off light. They weren't, there wasn't any sort of glow on the roof of my house, and they themselves weren't really 
uh, glowing. It was like a self-contained light. It, it Very strange to describe, to be honest, because the more I think about it, the more I think, well, it literally it didn't behave like a normal light. There wasn't refraction onto the surrounding environment. It was almost as if it wasn't really there, which is kind of crazy, right? I mean, I have thought about that. I have thought about, well, maybe these are psychic projections. You know, no one was with me to see these ones. No one was with me when they, when the orange orbs turned up. So, I mean, I only have, I only have my own subjective data to, to draw upon. Um, maybe they weren't technically there, but my god something happened you know it really happened so the so these or so these orbs were above my house hovering three feet above the roof of my house um they maybe stayed frozen above there for about three to four seconds before they suddenly started moving again weaving in between each other in this very smooth display of motion and they gently moved over to my neighbor's garden, which you can actually kind of see over there, like basically where that wall is and you can see uh, the trees. That's where they were. They just kind of came over from the roof of my house and they went over to my neighbor's garden and then they froze again as if someone had just pressed pause. It was because of the strange movements they were making as they traversed, it made the pausing like really jarring because it was seriously just like moving around and stop. Like, complete stop. So they hovered above my neighbor's back garden for, it's hard to say, um, a handful of seconds before ascending slowly back up into the sky, dancing around each other like fireflies as they did it. And uh, and, and this, this happened to me. You know, whether you believe it or not is entirely up to you, but it happened. I saw these orbs on four separate occasions and, uh, and I'm now playing you some footage. Now this is not my footage, but when I found it, I was stunned because this is exactly what they look like. The formations are extremely similar. The movements are exactly on the mark as well as the appearance, which is identical to what I saw myself. But only once did they come down from the sky outside of the uh, triangle and the house visit. They simply flew by on two other occasions from the left hand side of my sky to the right. They just kind of traversed the sky in about six or seven seconds and they were in different kind of V style and W style formations with some of these orbs trailing off of the back. I have no idea what these things are. I had no direct messages from them. They just presented themselves to me on four separate evenings and I haven't seen them again. But that is also uh, because I fell off the, the path, so to speak, for a while with these kind of practices. Uh, life got in the way, the highs and lows of human experience got in the way. And I'm now in the process of rekindling that desire to engage more with this phenomenon and to see if this really is a journey towards a more direct form of communication because in some ways it does truly feel like a step-by-step -step progression that is leading towards you being acclimated enough to actually face these intelligences without having a mental breakdown. But as we kind of wrap this up, I really want to stress that outside of some of these mechanics I've outlined that I believe are the reason why this contact works, the contact itself is a highly personal endeavor. And I can't tell you the right words to say. I can't tell you the right feelings to express. I can't tell you the right way to get into this mindset that is required. That part of it is your own personal challenge, your own puzzle to figure out. I honestly just sit there and just explain in my mind how I feel the universe works. And then I invite others to come and respond to it if they think it's right. And I'll just project these thoughts over and over, imagining that they are flowing from me and out into reality. And honestly, when it really feels like it's working, that's when contact happens. So that's how I do it, but that might not be how you do it. So you have to find a way that works, but keep in mind these ideas that I've presented because I feel that they'll provide a good framework for the reasons why this is possible. And let's just finish with this, right? I know for myself, my own personal evidence, I know that there are intelligences out there that respond to love. And that to me is the real keystone here. They respond to open, expanded, loving states of consciousness. The same states that our spiritual advisors have pleaded with us to engage in for thousands of years. The message has been the same. We are all connected and love is the most powerful force in existence. If you can understand this and if you can apply it, 
you will be fortunate to be one of those humans that gets to see evidence that not only are we not alone, but that we are loved, and that we are considered precious, that we are important and we have a role to play, that we're not just the mistakes that we make as a species, but that there is a value within us that is recognized by an intelligence that quite obviously is of a much higher order of evolutionary, spiritual, and perhaps technological sophistication, and it wants you to know that it can hear you. That, to me, is a life-changing understanding to have. So I hope my words here can help you in some way to be able to move towards gaining that understanding for yourself. Thank you, as always, for being here. I'm doing these talks because I feel inspired to do them. The ideas for them come to me usually late at night, and I end up feverishly typing at 100 miles an hour, getting all this information out that feels like it's building up. And, you know, I do these talks because something deep down in my intuition tells me that people need to hear it. And not everyone will understand. You know, that's okay, but not everyone will listen. There will be those who close their minds off to this possibility, but I'm telling you, it's real. And I think one of my reasons for existing, at least to me, is to help spread this understanding, to do my best to explain it in ways that can be applied more towards our modern perception of reality. I think that those that are still here listening now, you're already truly curious souls. If you're listening up until this point, then you have undoubtedly become ready to have contact. And in a time where the UFO issue is being looked at by governments as a potential threat to their national security and their sovereignty and their airspace, I feel it's important for us to be reminded that there is a profound, life-changing experience available to each of us through our own conscious interface. And it is an experience that is facilitated for us by what is, of course, an unknown intelligence. And yet the way in which these specific unknowns demonstrate themselves is to me an extremely suggestive set of behaviours that leads me personally to the conclusion that whatever it is that you're interacting with through these contact modalities, its intention is to assist you in expanding your mind. That's it. It's here to expand your mind. And that's no bad thing in my opinion. If you enjoyed this talk, please remember to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment below. Let me know what you're thinking about all of this. Have you had success before? Are you thinking of trying it? Do you think I'm completely delusional and should be locked away? Tell me in the comments below. And if you want to support my work even further and gain early access to content as well as access to our amazing private Discord server, then you can sign up to become a Patreon of Project Unity. A link can be found in the description box below alongside a cheeky PayPal link for those one-time donations. I'm not in this for money. But if I can make a living helping others, then that's a living worth making. And that's my true goal here, to help others awaken to reality as I myself awaken to it. Uh, to be on this journey together, learning and sharing ideas. But it definitely helps to have those who are willing to and, uh, and are able to support my work. And you're very much appreciated. Take care, stay curious, and I'll see you next time.